You're listening to the First Baptist Rockdale Sunday Sermons Podcast. First Baptist Rockdale is a church dedicated to making disciples who make disciples. We hope you enjoy this week's message. Church family, we are looking through the book of John. If you have your Bible, open to John chapter 1. Uh, and what John chapter 1 is dealing with is the backstory that leads to the arrival of Jesus Christ. So we've already dealt with the far back story in the prologue of John 1, 1 through 18, where it talks about Jesus being before anything, how Jesus was the creative word and that life is it exists inside of Jesus and that Jesus is the Messiah who was to come to bring salvation to those who would believe. The book of John is written as a book to tell us to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That is the purpose of of the book of John. If you're looking for something to read this year to kind of uh, uh, help you as you start 2021, reading through the book of John uh, as in, in a tight sequence over the course of a couple of days, you will be strongly encouraged that you are following the right one if you look to Jesus Christ. We're going to talk today, though, about your ability to follow Jesus Christ. You know, the world around us seeks to make us leaders, right? There are leadership classes. There's leadership courses, right? I don't have an issue with that, right? I serve in a leadership capacity at this church. Many of you serve in leadership capacities inside of your spheres of influence. There's nothing wrong with being a leader, with having people who follow you because everything needs some direction to point where they go. But we're so leadership focused as a society that we lose sight of the fact that as disciples of Christ, we're called to be followers first, right? We're called primarily to be followers of Jesus Christ. Even myself, who is the pastor of this church, my leadership should always be following Jesus Christ. A good term for a pastor is an under shepherd, right? You have the good shepherd, which is Jesus Christ, and I serve underneath his authority and under his direction, and I only lead in the direction that he would have me to lead. But we're so focused on leadership and brand building. You know, inside of the pastoral world, you may not know this, there's a tendency to want to build a brand around the pastor. Um, our, the first time I was exposed to this uh, was probably Lakewood Church, right? Joel Osteen emerged as this, like, entity above the church that he served at, right? Joel predominantly was the pastor at Lakewood Church in Houston, Texas. But all of a sudden, Lakewood Church seemed to diminish in its appearance, and Joel Osteen began to become lifted above it. Uh, years later, I was working in Kingwood, Texas, and there was a church that was being planted, Um, And it was on the highway, on Highway 59. And the web address they pointed you to learn about the church was thepastorsname.com. Right? That was the, you want to learn about this church, it would be matthigginbotham.com. Find out more about this church, matthigginbotham.com. That's a problem, right? Because the church, right, which is the entity that God has, as the bride of Christ, has set up, uh, all of a sudden has become co-opted by these, these shepherds who are supposed to be leading under Christ's authority. It's a scary thing, this brand building thing. In fact, I could pay someone to build my brand as a pastor, right? And then they would work with me on how to blog in a way and how to tweet in a way and how to Instagram in a way and how to build my brand so that whenever I go out, I can get jobs on the speaking circuit and the consulting circuit and I can have people and they're like, oh, that's Matt Higginbotham. Where is he from? I don't know, but he's a great pastor. Well, where does he preach? I'm not sure, but he's a wonderful speaker and communicator. Right? There's an idea of building a brand outside of Jesus Christ, right? Building your own kingdom. And this isn't just in the church world, it's all across the world, right? You you have this idea, and especially in the age of social media, where you can become this Instagram influencer. That became a job somehow. I have a niece, uh, maybe a second cousin. I'm not really sure how relations work, okay? Um, uh, I think it's a second cousin. She's an Instagram influencer. That's her job. She's like 22 years old. She bought a house. What does she do? She takes like one picture a day. She probably takes more than that. She posts one picture a day, right? That's her job as as an Instagram influencer. And that's, uh, I, I guess, good for her that she's found a way to capitalize on the world that we live in today. But it's all brand building. It's all pointing people back to you from your different revenue streams to all funnel back to make something 
at the end of it. And that's a dangerous game to play in your life. If your entire life is about building your individual brand to strengthen yourself from a variety uh, of different avenues, you have lost focus on what you are called to be as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Because disciples of Jesus Christ follow Jesus Christ. And Jesus is beginning his ministry. We pick up in John chapter 1, starting in verse 19. And it says, and this is the testimony of John, this is the Baptist, um, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? And John the Baptist confessed, and he did not deny, but he confessed, I am not the Christ. And then they asked him, well, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I'm not. And they said, are you the prophet? And he said, no. And so they said to him, well, who are you? We need to give an answer to those people who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And John said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah has said. Now they had been sent from, uh, uh, now they had been sent from the Pharisees. So they asked him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And John answered then, look, I baptize you with water. But among you stands one who you do not know, and even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. And these things took place in Bethany across the Jordan River where John was baptized. And so John is out there in the wilderness. He's doing the baptism thing. People come to him and say, who are you? There were rumors about John. Some people thought he might be the Messiah, the one who was promised to lead Israel back to a, a, a place of prominence and power against the oppressive Roman regime. And John says, I am not the Messiah. And they said, well, are you Elijah? There was this promise that Elijah would come in the flesh and he would return from the chariots of fire and he would come in the power that he had had. And he said, look, I'm not, I'm not Elijah. They said, are you the prophet, some great prophet proclaiming something? He says, I'm not even the prophet who's coming to proclaim something. They said, well, who are you? And John says, I am a guy who's coming before the guy you need to be looking for. Right? John had built a following. There were people. He had disciples who followed him. There were people who hung on every word that he said. When John spoke, people listened. The power brokers of his day came to see him. They said, who are you? What are you about? What are you doing? And John says, look, this is who I am. I'm a guy who comes before the guy, right? John knew that his responsibility was to point people to Jesus Christ. Your job as a follower of Jesus Christ, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, is to consistently point people away from you into Jesus Christ. This is why all those brand-centric things where they're focused back at you become very, very damaging. Right, because you begin to puff yourself up and you look behind you and you have a herd of people who follow you and a herd of people who like your picture and who comment on your things and say, oh, what a cute family or, or what a good job or, or whatever positive thing. But the truth is we do not exist for our own glory. We exist to point people to Jesus Christ. There is a better person to point people to. And while people may follow you, while people may listen to you, or if you're a parent here today, I want you to know your kids listen to you. They want to hear from you, even as an adult. My dad uh, is like, I don't know, he's like 70, I guess now. Uh, and I'm 38 years old. I am a grown man, right? I'm almost Mike Gundy aged. I'm a man. I'm 40. Any Oklahoma State? No. Okay, I tried, right? <laughs> That's a, Years ago, uh, Mike Gundy, the head coach of Oklahoma State, uh, someone was getting on to his students for doing something, and he yelled at the media for, for like, why are you getting on to him? He's like, a, he's, a, he's a child. Get on to me. I'm a man. I'm 40. Okay, well, that's that. Go YouTube. It's worth, worth 20 seconds of your time. But, right, like, I, I'm 38 years old. By most accounts, I'm a grown-up, right? By most accounts. Some of you may question that, but I have six children, uh, and I have been an adult uh, since I was 18 years old. I got married when I was 19 years old. I've been off of my parents' Uh, apron strings pretty much since then. Um, so I, I've been doing this adult thing for half of my life now. I'm pretty much an adult, but if my dad was to call me now and say, son, I need to talk to you about something, I would listen to my father. I, he has an influence on me. Now, even years later, I don't live with him. I haven't lived with him in 19 years, but if my dad were to call me today and say, son, I need to sit down, you need to sit down and talk to you about something, I'm going to listen 
to my father because he's influenced on me. How much more so whenever I was a younger person? If you have children in your home today, I want you to know your kids listen to you. So point them to Jesus. Point them to Jesus. Stop pointing them to you and about how great you are or how terrible you are. Point them to Jesus. Because as followers of Jesus Christ, we point people back to Jesus. John knew his role. He didn't get confused about it. He didn't think, maybe I'm supposed to build this following. And, you know, once you have the following, it's kind of tempting to keep it. Right? To be like, well, these people are already here. How can I get a few more here? And maybe we can find a way to monetize this. And uh, we'll get some, like, in-video advertisements. And we'll add all that together. Now, all of a sudden, I don't ever have to work again because these people pay for me to live. No, John, his whole being was focused on pointing people to the one who was to come. When people asked him what he's doing, he said, I'm pointing people there. Is that true of you? Do the people who follow you, who listen to you, who are influenced by you, are you pointing them to Jesus or are you pointing them back to you? Are you making them dependent on you instead of dependent on Christ? Continuing on, it says the next day after this, in in verse 29, uh, he saw Jesus coming toward him. And he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself didn't know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, and he said, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself didn't know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. So John, the next day after these uh, people who are coming from the Pharisees to report back about who John is, the very next day, Jesus comes wandering down towards the Jordan River, and John sees him, and he knows immediately this is the one. John wasn't even aware of exactly who he was preparing the way for. He knew there was one coming. The Messiah was coming. It was around the corner. It was imminent. He knew that was his job to point people towards Jesus Christ. He understood that that's what he was trying to accomplish, that he was going to point people to Jesus Christ. And he thought that he would would allow them to come to, to, to Jesus Christ. When Jesus emerged, John said, that is the one. That's the Son of God. That's the one who brings salvation to the world. And so John's testimony didn't just point people to Jesus Christ, but when he saw Jesus Christ, he clearly proclaimed who he was. As followers of Jesus Christ, you have a responsibility to clearly proclaim who Jesus is. That means you have to recognize who Jesus is, that he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You have to know that inside of your hearts to the point that when someone comes to you and you start pointing them to Jesus Christ, you're not pointing them to some uh, like weird artifact of the past. Right? We have a tendency to do that, to, 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 to force Jesus to become this like, historical-only figure. Like he existed back then and he did these things back then. But he's a present force today. Right? He is the one who hasn't just wiped away sins on the cross, but he's still in the business of taking sins. He's still in the business of saving souls. This is who Jesus is. So as a follower of Jesus Christ, not only do we point people towards Jesus Christ, we clearly proclaim who Christ is in our words and our speech. I boil down the gospel to ten words for you, right? Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead. That's 11. I might have counted one twice, okay? But Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead. That is the gospel message. That is who Jesus is. He is the Lamb of God who took our sins and did not stay dead, but rather beat death back. That's who we serve. And if you can learn that gospel proclamation, you will have a message to share. People don't need to hear your opinion on every matter. You can have opinions on every matter. In fact, I have opinions on most everything, right? Sit me down, ask me whether or not the Rockets should trade James Harden. I can talk to you about that. What are my opinions on the Rockets and James Harden? By the way, they should not trade him until they get maximum value. That's my opinion 
on the Rockets and James Harden. I know y'all were hanging on that, right? That's why you come to church to hear the pastor's sports text, right? Right? Should the, should the Dallas Cowboys shut down their football operations? Yes, obviously. They should shut down their football operations. The Dallas Cowboys, right? I have opinions on all sorts of things. Right? Do you think it's going to rain? I don't know. Right? Like, hopefully. Right? right? I have opinions. You can have an opinion on everything you want. You can have political opinions. You can have uh, educational opinions. You can have opinions on um, theological issues, like minutia. Like, people want to talk to me about doctrines of predestination and election and foreknowledge. And, like, I have opinions on all those things. I really do. And they're biblically informed. But you know what people don't? need from you they don't need all of your opinions they need jesus they need a clearly portrayed picture of the lamb of god who died to take away their sins they don't need to know why you voted the way you voted you can tell them that but it's not valuable information for them they don't need to know why your uh any of your any of your opinions about any of the hot button issues of the day you can have them. You can share them. Inside of conversations, they're fine to have. Small talk is a wonderful thing, but they must know who Jesus is. Followers of Christ point people to Jesus, and they clearly proclaim who Jesus is. If you're not clearly proclaiming who Jesus is, if you're just hoping somehow by being around you, they're going to find out who Jesus is, you're doing it wrong. Like, oh, I'm a good person, and I don't lie, and I don't steal, and I don't cheat on my spouse, so then they know Jesus. No, they don't know Jesus. They know what like a not terrible person looks like. Good job. Right? Way to go not being a terrible person. They need to know Jesus. Your Mormon neighbor is a good person. Right? Your Muslim friends. I don't know if you have Muslim friends. I have Muslim friends. My Muslim friends are good people. Moral, upstanding, upright people. Not the people bombing buildings. Okay? Good people. People I would trust to watch my children for for a day or a week even if I had to leave them with someone. Reliable, trustworthy people. But those people do not know Jesus. They need to know him. It's not enough to be a good person or a moral person or an upstanding person or a pillar of the community or someone who has strong political or theological opinions. You need to tell people about Jesus. Don't get lost in the woods. I have a brother. I love this brother. I have like three brothers. I guess I love them all equally. Okay. But I have a brother, uh, and I love him. Right? He's wandered from the faith. Hurts my heart. It really does. Hurts my heart. And one of the times I was having a conversation with him, he was so hung up on Genesis chapter 1 through Genesis chapter 11. There's a lot that goes on. There. The world is created. You've got a talking snake. You've got a flood. There's a lot of things that happens in those things. You have to tower about it. There's a lot that happens in those first 11 chapters of Genesis. And I looked at him and I said, hey, like we can talk about this a lot. And I can try to convince you that what the Bible says is reliable and accurate and useful. But the truth is, like you know, like you know that you're broken. And you know that Jesus Christ brings healing to broken people. And if the first 11 chapters of the Bible, just you can't deal with them right now, that's okay. Start at chapter 12. Start at chapter 12. I think there's a lot in Genesis chapters 1 through 11. It's in fact, it's some of my favorite stuff in the Bible is in those chapters. It lays out the problem of mankind. But, but my brother knows he's sinful. He doesn't need me to point back to Adam and Eve to prove to him that he's sinful. Right? He knows the world is broken and that, that, that there is a wickedness, there is a brokenness in our system today. He doesn't need me to point to the flood to prove that to him. What he needs to know is that Jesus died for sinners like and we can get so distracted in little arguments that we lose sight of the big thing. Politics is, is bad at this, right? We get distracted with it, right? They, they focus on this shiny ball over here. Focus on it, focus on it, focus on it. It's tempting. It's power, right? It's the ring. It's there. But don't, don't. Please. Have, have political queens vote. Do, do, do your due diligence, American. I'm not telling you not to do that. I'm not telling you to think like I think. But put Jesus first. Proclaim him 
clearly. Before people know who you voted for, if, you, if your neighbor knows how you vote and they don't know you know, love Jesus Christ and that Jesus loves them, you are failing as a Christian. Right? If your sign out front of your house says Trump, Biden, whatever, right, and it says it big and bold and it's publicly proclaimed, but they don't know how you experience Jesus Christ and how Jesus wants to change their life, you're not doing this thing right. Focus on the things that matter. Church, we don't have an infinite amount of time. Right? We don't have forever to get this right. So those people who will listen to you, the people who are around you, who you have an influence on, proclaim Jesus to them. Continuing on in verse 35, it says, The next day again, so this is the third day, I guess, John was standing with two of his own disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him say this, and they turned and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned around, and he saw them falling, and he said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come, and you'll see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was at the tenth hour. And one of the two who had heard John speak and followed, Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And he first found his own brother Simon, and he said to him, Look, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John, and you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. Now here's the deal. John doesn't just uh, like point people back to Jesus Christ. John doesn't just proclaim clearly who Jesus Christ is. John actively encourages people to stop listening to him and to fully listen to Jesus. These are his disciples, people who are close to him. And he turns around and he says, hey guys, why are you following me? There's the Lamb of God, go. And we are, that, that, that sort of empowerment to look and say, stop listening to me, go listen to Jesus is very difficult to do. Because all of us, deep in our hearts, want people to listen to us. We want to be the authority. We want to be the one who people look to for, for, for wisdom. The one who people look to for clarity. Right? We want to be the one. But Jesus says, no, you're not going to be the one. I'm the one. Tell people to come to me. John gave up his authority. So that his disciples could follow him, and we too are called to humbly give our authority away so that others can find Jesus Christ. That means you don't just use your authority to brand build and to make yourself there. You constantly tell people, I know that you like listening to me. I know that you're interested in my opinions. You'll be more interested and better served going to Jesus. Constantly sending people to Jesus. And that's hard. Because you take your kingdom and it diminishes so that God's kingdom can increase. Right? Pride is a sneaky little sin. If there was a sin that scares me most about my own life, it's pride. Right? I stand on a platform that's raised above y'all. That's nice. Right? That's, that, that'll make you humble. Right? And I get up and I get to talk for an indefinite amount of time. Sometimes it feels more indefinite than others. Let's be honest. Right? And you have to hang on every word I say or the person next to you nudges you. Right? It's, it's a natural thing. Pride is a sneaky little thing and it jumps in and it says, you're good. You're good. Look at you. It happens in our lives. Right? It, it sneaks up on us and says, you're good. You're better than. Oh, look at, look at how much you're doing. And that little voice that jumps in your head, not just my head, Righteous, righteous people out there. Not just, not just my head. It jumps into your head. It tells you you're better than this person. Or that you deserve. I was driving down the highway yesterday. I, you know how much I hate you deserve a whatever. Right? I was driving through Columbus, Texas yesterday. Uh, and it said you deserve a pie. You don't deserve a pie. You deserve death and hell. That's what you deserve, okay? You deserve death and hell. Go to Shovel's and get a pie. But you don't deserve that pie. And some of us shouldn't eat the pie, right? Let's be honest, right? You deserve a pie. You deserve a donut. You deserve a Dr. Pepper. No, you don't. Death and hell, that's what you deserve. Nothing else. No, that's what I deserve, too. By the way, I'll make sure I tell you that. 
when we get in trouble later. I also deserve death and hell. But through the grace of Jesus Christ, we are given love, acceptance, and eternal life. Grace is undeserved, but we're so thankful for it. You deserve punishment. So point people to that Jesus Christ and give your authority away. Purposefully tell people it's okay to stop listening and to start focusing on Jesus. This is tough for pastors to do, but I try to do this to you. Guys, my, my preaching method is straightforward, right? I go through the Bible. Uh, you know next week, uh, if you come here next week, I will be in John chapter 2. Why? Because I'm going to finish John chapter 1 today. Next week I'll be in John chapter 2. I feel very confident about that. Unless something crazy happens, that's where I'll be preaching. Right? And it's pretty straightforward, and I just kind of preach straight through. But here's one of the reasons I preach this way. Is I want my preaching to be biblically sound. And I want to be underneath the authority of God's word. And I find that if I jump around, I can skip around and skip stuff that I don't like to say. A lot of things in the Bible I don't want to say to you. A lot of things in the Bible I don't want to say to you. That don't, it doesn't sound well in 2020. It doesn't, doesn't mesh well with our culture. So I'd like to just skip that and move on to the easy stuff. Jesus loves you. Right, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. That's good. Right, you're a good person because God loves you. That's not in there, by the way. That's, that's pretty, pretty rough. Now, there's a lot of stuff in there I don't want to say, but, I, but I, I've intentionally put myself underneath this constraint because I don't want to skip something because it's hard. I want to tell you what God has to say. But I also want you to know you have the responsibility to check what I say to make sure it's what God says. You know, you're in the middle of my Esther sermon series. My wife came to me and said, you're wrong. She was wrong, by the way. Full, full disclosure. She was wrong. But, but she thought... I was wrong, which is great. That's her, that's her job as a discerning person to listen to what I say. She got upset because I said Esther was wicked for wanting to put off doing what God had told her to do. That's what she upset about. But Esther's the dang hero in the story outside of Jesus, or outside of God. Like, whatever. We'll deal with that later. Right? But that's what she was upset about. She thought that I was too hard on Esther. Whenever really, like, Esther did a pretty good job. All, all things told, for the situation she was in, she did pretty good. But there was a moment in there where she was totally wrong. Just totally 100% wrong. My wife didn't like that. But you know what I love about my wife? Is that she is biblically informed. And so when she feels like the Bible has been wrongly told to the church, she's going to come and tell me. I hope that you have that same sense. I've got that sense. It's called the gift of discernment. I believe it's a real spiritual gift. It's in the Bible. When I, when I sit down there and I listen to people up here, it's hard sometimes for me. Not, not in the, all everyone who preaches here is great because I, I, I beat them into goodness. But when I listen to sermons on like the radio, it's hard for me sometimes not just to yell at the radio. Right? Because they're wrong. The reason that I have that is because I understand the ultimate authority is Jesus Christ, not that guy who's speaking. Guys, I am not the authority on the Bible. God is the authority on the Bible. The counsel of God is the authority on the Bible. Trust what God says. I want you to listen to Jesus over Matt. And if I lead you in the wrong direction, kick me, tell me I'm wrong, point me back where I'm supposed to be. And if I won't change, work to get me out of here. Work to get me out of here. It's not going to be easy, by the way, because I'm stubborn. But work to get me out of here. Right? That's your job. Because you don't follow Matt Higginbotham. This church will never have a web address. It's matthigginbotham.com. First of all, it's tough to spell, right? But second of all, like, this church is not me. It's not about me. It's not about my kingdom. It's about Jesus first. So if you find something there, I want you to, to, to follow Jesus. And if you find that I'm wrong, talk to me. I, I will try to humbly listen to what you say. No guarantees because pride, right? But I will try. I will try. But followers of Christ humbly give up their authority. Whatever authority you have, you give it up to follow Jesus Christ. And the final thing that we see here after Peter and uh, Andrew are followers of Christ is we have Jesus the next day. He's now the fourth day, verse 43. It says, the next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. And he found Philip, and he said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael, and he said to him, look, we have found him whom, the Mo whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son 
of Joseph and Nathaniel, one of the future disciples, responds to this news and says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? It's like Nazareth is Cameron or something. I mean, come on now. Right? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? That's a low blow on Cameron, by the way. I, I, side note. I, I took a shot at Cameron a few weeks ago, and then I was told by someone who lives in Cameron who was watching online that that was out of bounds. So I'm sorry, Cameron. Okay? But you're no Thorndale. All right, continuing on. It says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. And so Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him. He said, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. And Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? And Jesus said, Philip, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under a fig tree, you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he did. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So, so you have Philip who gets called by Jesus. Jesus wanders into town uh, in the Galilee region, sees Philip, says, come with me. Philip looks, he sees Jesus, he sees uh, Andrew and Peter, and he's like, all right, looks like I'm following those guys. He knew those guys. They said, this is the Messiah. He's like, I'm on board. He's following Jesus for a little while. He's like, I got to go tell my brother. He runs to go see his brother. By the way, Philip is the best Bible inspiration you can have as a, as a New Testament disciple. Because anytime you see Philip in the Bible, he is taking people to Jesus Christ. That's his only job in the Bible is he's like, come see Jesus. Right? He's just grabbing people and dragging them to Jesus. So he goes to see Nathaniel. And he goes and he's like, Nathaniel, we have found the one we've been looking for. By the way, that's a, that's a wonderful phrase, right? The one we've been seeking. I found him. That means these people have been looking for Jesus Christ. Their life has been dedicated to searching for the Messiah. They knew he was coming. John had said he was coming. And so their eyes were open. They were aware and looking for the Messiah. And then they grab the Messiah, or he grabs his brother. He says, we're going. It's Jesus of Nazareth. And his brother is like, eh, I think you got it wrong, brother. Nazareth's kind of a terrible place. And it must have been a pretty terrible place. It had a reputation. Right? There are neighborhoods where I grew up in the Houston area that have reputations. Right? So if you're like, oh, this guy's from the Fifth Ward, you're like, ooh. Sure about that. Really? I don't know if that's a guy I want to hang out with right now. He looks a little dangerous. Right? He's from Sunnyside. Ooh, okay. I'm gonna pass on having dinner with the guy from Sunnyside. If that's all the same to you, that sounds like a bad move for someone from the suburbs to be doing right now. I'm gonna pass on that. Nazareth had a reputation, not a good reputation according to Nathaniel. Maybe they just got beat a lot in like high school, whatever they did back there in Nazareth. Okay? Um, but He's like, well, and then Philip says, well, just come and see. So he drags his brother to Jesus, his brother who's been looking for the Messiah. And Jesus says, there's an Israelite in whom there's no deceit. I love that phrase. By the way, that's a phrase that was used about my pastor, uh, my last pastor. I wish that was used about me. Y'all could start saying that. Like, Matt is an Israelite in whom there is no guy. But that's the King James version of this. That's what I was told about my pastor. He's like, he may make some mistakes, but nothing he's doing is out of, out of ill will. He's just... He's, he's a true blue follower of Jesus Christ. So in this case, this guy is following Israel like laws. He desires the Messiah to come. And he says, how do you know me? Like Jesus speaks to him as if he knows who he is. And he says, well, I saw you under the fig tree earlier. Which does not seem like miraculous to me at all, by the way. But Jesus saw him under a fig tree. But Nathaniel knew in that moment, like, oh my goodness. This is the Son of God. I don't know how. I don't know what broke in his mind. They're like, yeah, I saw you over there. Like, it would be similar to me being like, I've got some people with me. And I was like, hey, come, uh, call your brother. So they call your brother. And I was like, hey, how you doing? It's like, yeah, hey, I saw you over at Corona's. And they'd be like, yeah, man. But for some reason, him being on the fig tree was a, a, a dramatic experience. Maybe he thought he was alone. And Jesus just kind of like supernaturally saw him where he was isolated all by himself. But whatever it was, Nathaniel was convinced, you are the son of God. And Jesus says, you have not seen anything yet. You're about to see some stuff. That's pretty amazing. You'll see heaven open, angels descending, and ascending. you are going to see some great power. At the crucifixion, Nathaniel would have seen some things that no one else had ever seen before. But what, what, what his brother did was he found other seekers, and he took them. 
to Jesus Christ. As a church, that's what we need to be about. Finding people who are open to hearing about Jesus Christ and taking them to Jesus Christ. We should not be alone in this room very often. Right? We should be taking those people with us, those people who are open to spiritual conversation, those people who are people of peace, as the Bible talks about them later in missionary terms, and taking them to see Jesus Christ. Because in Jesus is life and hope, and outside of Jesus is death in despair. And if you're living a life of life and hope, and your friend is someone who's living a life of death and despair, how terrible of a friend are you not to take them to life and hope? But we don't. Because it's uncomfortable. They may say no. They may not want to go. But here's the truth. The vast majority of people who are seeking something better than the world that they live in right now, which is a decent number of people in our world, if you were to go to them and say, hey, I want you to come with me, they will come with you. Maybe not the first Sunday. They may have a thing. They may have to go fishing or fix their truck or whatever. But if you will ask them persistently, consistently, hey, why don't you come with me? They will come because they, they, they know you. They know you're not insane, hopefully. But they know you. And they, and they know they're not right. They know this world isn't, it, it just feels wrong. And they have that sense. And you say you have an answer. So bring them with you. You can do personal evangelism. I'm a big fan of personal evangelism. Tell them the story of what Jesus did. But also just bringing them here among fellow believers is a valuable way to get people to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. That Christ died for sinners and rose and that Jesus gives life to anybody. That, that he was seeking an answer for. Who is the Messiah? Who is going to bring hope? Who's going to bring restoration? Who's going to fix this mess? And Philip says it's this Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathaniel was skeptical, but as soon as he met Jesus, he knew that is the one. If you're here today and you need hope, I want you to know it's found nowhere else except Jesus Christ. All the other bits of hope that we have are false hope. Just little, little, little twinges of hope light. But Jesus gives us hope eternal. We have hope for a future with him. We have life today through him. So if you need to believe on Jesus Christ, we're going to have an invitation in just a minute. You can come and you can believe on Jesus Christ. You can do it right now, today. Uh, what, a, what a blessing it would be. If you're a believer here today, I want you to know you have a responsibility though to pull people with you to Jesus Christ, and to recognize that those people that you want to bring to church, that you want to sit next to you, that you want to have a part of God's eternal kingdom, a lot of them have that desire too. They just need you to come alongside of them. They need someone to know. Because when you walk in this room, just full disclosure, when you walk in this room, it's weird. If you've never been in church, or it's been a while since you've been in church, or you don't know the people in this church, you walk in, it's a weird experience. All you people sit in weird places. You stand up and sing songs. How weird is that? Nowhere else in the world do we sing like together except maybe the national anthem. Like, nowhere else do we sing publicly like we do in church. What a weird expression that is. It's all a little bit foreign. It's different. I'm okay with it. Like Obviously, I'm here. But it helps if you have a safe place to go. Your friends, they, they may want to come. But they need you to be with them, beside them, helping them, easing them in. That's your job. We don't just follow Christ. We don't just point people to Christ. We don't just clearly proclaim who Jesus Christ is. We seek Jesus Christ above all else. And we make his kingdom big. Above all that we do, we seek to follow Jesus Christ. Is that you today? Is that true of you today? Above everything else, are you seeking to make Jesus known? And are you seeking to follow him? If you are, how does it look? Are people turning to follow Jesus Christ? Are people leaving your sphere of influence to enter into his sphere of influence?
are people surrendering their lives from a life dedicated to themselves to a life dedicated on his lordship of Jesus Christ. If they're not, you're probably not doing it flawlessly. It's okay, I'm not either. We've got a new year, though. Let's do it. Let's seek above everything else to follow Jesus Christ. Let me pray.